Greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well today. Today I have a very amazing interview, horrifying experience that is going to be shared with us right now. But before we get into it, a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support this channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It doesn't cost you a cent. Click that like button. Takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon. And folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because these things really do help this channel to continue to grow and go. And yes, they definitely do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in to today's upload, shall we? All right, everyone. Today I have a subscriber with us. He is out of northeastern Pennsylvania. His name's Quinn. He had a dogman encounter. I actually narrated on the channel a while back. Um, Quinn, how are you today? Oh, not too bad. How you doing, Jeff? Doing well, doing well. Uh, thanks for taking some time out of your day to share your experiences with us. I know you have Dogman and uh, Bigfoot experiences. Sure. Um, so I'm going to turn the mic over to you. Why don't you kind of let everyone know, uh, you don't have to share exactly where or where you're from, but like set lay lay the layout of the land for us so we all can kind of get a get a mental picture of where this kind of occurred and what happened. So the mic's yours, my friend. Okay, Jeff. Thank, thanks a lot. I really appreciate you uh, having me on. And I appreciate everybody for listening. Um, my first experience, or the only experience I had with a, with a dog man type creature. Um, I was, I was five years old. My father had just built a house on a, on a new piece of property that was part of a, a farm in a very rural, rural area in uh, northeastern Pennsylvania. I'm actually in what's called the, the slate belt. And he was, we weren't moved into the new house yet. And he was, uh, dri he was driving me, um, to the property to catch the bus, um, to, to go to school. Again, I was, this was, uh, in 1975 in September, I was a kindergartner. And as we were, coming now i'm going to give you some orientation like north south east and west because it's really hard to describe how this happened without giving some you know directions right. so so if you can picture we're 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 uh <clears throat> we're headed westbound and it's a it's a small country road the property to the north had another road that was even a, a smaller country road that was gravel so we, on the north we were bordered by a small gravel road and um you know on the south it was a county road and uh that was paved um it was the beginning of september uh, most of the foliage everything had fallen off the trees it wasn't super cold yet this year but it was you know it was a, a very a very temp you know temp tepid uh september um as we were we were driving you know westbound on on the county road that actually went was bordered to the front of our our property where the driveway would meet it um there were there's a the, there's a y there where the the, the backcountry road goes to the back of the property and we're going straight um as we're driving my father pointed out that he saw something really large and black off to our right hand side which would be to the north and 
and he, he pointed it out and he asked me if I saw it or did I, did I see that? And I said, yeah, that, um, he said this, something big and black over, over there on the, on the side of the property. Well, he saw it at, before I did. And then I looked, when I looked, it had crossed the, the back gravel road and had stood up on the border of the fields. And it was trying to hide itself between two mulberry trees. They were on the, the border of the field with the, with the back road there. Now I want to just say this. It came down out of the woods, but the woods were where, where the woods were a, uh, um, were where there were some retired slate quarries. This is the slate belt. So it was, wasn't really a mountain, but it was where all their refuse and stuff had, had been dumped and the trees and everything grew up over it. And there was a guy that lived up there. He owned all, all three slate quarries. It was roughly about a hundred acres of property from what I was told, but heavily wooded. So this large, you know, black wolf came down off the, off of this uh, area from the woods, crossed the road on all fours, and it stood up in the fence row and tried to hide itself between you know, two mulberry trees. Um, the, the branch that was closest to the top of its head, my father and I ended up measuring it at a later time, obviously, um, but it was over, it was close to 12 feet. So the, when this thing, you know, stood up, it was almost 12 feet tall. Um, just forever, for reference, the animal did look like it had elongated front, it didn't look like it had paws. It, its hands appeared, well, I say hands because that is what it would have looked like. They were elongated. Um, you could see that, you know, it looked like it had fairly large claws. So it dropped down on all fours again and it ran across our field. Now it's coming southbound we're going westbound and our paths are going to intersect here the animal ran with such an unbelievable amount of speed jeff it, it crossed about a, about 100 yards would have been the distance um we almost hit it you know my, my father actually floored the car he, he, he actually intentionally did try and hit the <laughs> thing you know because <laughs> let, let me just tell you my dad was a steel worker. He's a, an immigrant right off the boat. Um, five foot eight, about 225, solid muscle. I never, ever saw fear on this man's face when he looked at me after it ran across the road. Um, I know he, he was, he was afraid. First time in my life I ever saw fear in my dad's eyes. Right. So we were in old, 1971 Matador station wagon from AMC. Um, the thing was huge. It couldn't get out of its own way. So we just barely missed hitting the animals. Now, when it came up to the, when it came up to the road, I mean, it was, it, I got to stress this, the amount of speed that this thing had running across the field was, I mean, it was a, an amazing, it was, it was almost unnatural and it was, jet black too just to get, let everybody know the color the thing was jet black all over all over head tail everything so when it ran when it ran in front of us its left side would have been would have been facing our car um his sh the shoulder of the animal was roughly about a foot above the hood of the car uh, as it ran across the road it turned its head toward us it snarled showing all of its teeth um its canines were to me in my judgment were close to six inches the, the animal had a just a, an enormous head and it kept after it looked at us showed its teeth you know it, it was it was very scary let's put it that way but it never stopped moving and it when it was across the road from nose to tail it basically covered from one shoulder of the county road to the next, which we measured that to. That was approximately 20 feet. This, this animal was huge. The, uh, the hood itself was about three feet tall off the ground. So the animals at the, this animal at the shoulder would have been about four feet. Um, it had amber, 
amber eyes, like a yellowish amber eye. And uh, it was just unbelievably frightening to see this thing. Um, like I said, I never saw my father scared in his life, and I could tell he was frightened um, by what he saw because we, we just built that. He just built a house there, right. and he's got a five-year-old, a four-year-old, and an infant, excuse me. My uh, throat's getting a little dry. And a monster running on his property. <laughs> yeah. Well, well let, let me tell you, I mean, it was, it, it, we both really did a double take. We're like, we're like, you know, what the hell are we saying? Right. You know? And the, the thing, the thing had regular hawks, like a dog. Um, it, it had a, you know, big long snail. The head of this thing, Jeff, must have been elite, like, from the nose to its ears, I mean, it must have been like three feet. It was it, it was enormous. Um, it, like I said, it was just it was all inspiring to see it, and then terror, then you know, terrifying at the same time. Right. Um, but it had just un, ungodly speed and size to it. Um, now uh, I don't remember the timeline here really strictly but it was within a couple days or a week or so we ended up moving into this house and by the way my dad told me not to say anything to my mom he's like you know don't say anything to your mother she's going to be scared to death you know i i got a stay-at-home mom um raising me and you know when you're i had it was me your younger sister then an infant <clears throat> so you know, and I said, okay, dad, I won't say anything, blah, blah, blah. And I, I just can't, couldn't help but think like, you know, a couple of days before that, we were walking the property on foot. Like what if this thing would have came down, you know, out of the, out of the, slate, out of the woods, off the slate quarries, you know, while we were walking. Mm. And my father just kind of looks at me, he said, I don't know. He said, but it's really scary to think about. So, you know, don't think about it too much if you can so you know i did my best to keep my game face on it and tell my mom um so we moved into the house and out in this area of the country there was nothing there jeff it was all farms a house here or there um you could hear sound carry for miles uh, uh, just a general conversation somebody having a conversation on their porch half a mile up the road you, you just heard noises very clearly because they it just traveled around in the countryside. So, plus this guy was up higher than where my house was. He was up on on top of the uh, the, the refuse piles. You know, it wasn't a mountain height, but it was you know a little quite a bit higher than than where our house was. Uh, you know, elevation wise. <clears throat> so it, it was. We got like uh, an Indian summer after we had moved in. You know, we had the windows open one at night, and again. I remember if this was a couple, to, you know, a day or two or a couple days. I don't think it was longer than a week. I think it was like just a few days. So we, you know, we're moved in. My father's working third shift. Um, I used to work at a Ingersoll Rand. He's working, you know, third shift, and he's uh, about a half hour drive away. And um, the one night, you know, we're all we're in bed. The windows are all open. We're, you know, I had to get up for school the next day, obviously. And the next thing you know, like World War Three breaks out. Um, it, it was gunshot. Actually, let's, let's I'll be clear about it. it was a shotgun. He had a twelve gauge. I mean, the, he was just ripping, letting loose with a twelve gauge. And he had uh, about a dozen guard dogs up there. Hmm. Um, I don't remember the mixture of the dogs, but nineteen seventy five. Dobermans were popular guard dogs, shepherds, and you know, Roddies and stuff like that. I don't know what he had, but I know he had about a dozen dogs because there was always people trespassing on his property. Um, you know, kids would go try one quarry hole had a beach, even you know, kids would go swimming back there, you know, without his permission. Um, there were accidents, unfortunately. A couple of people did drown over the years because they fell into one of these uh, holes that was, you know, retired. And they never knew that they were there and, and so forth. So, you know, he tried to keep trespassers away. And these, you know, a lot of dogs. And, you know, they were pretty 
pretty vicious. You can hear them barking here and there, but um, I got to tell you this. This is the part that I have a hard time keeping out of my head. I mean, they were just getting slaughtered. <clears throat> I mean, you heard the dogs growling, barking, you know, you didn't hear idly enough. I don't remember hearing any kind of, you know, growling or, or uh, anything that I thought would have come from that animal. Mm -hmm. um, it's possible it did. Um, it is possible it did growl, but there was, listen, there was just all hell breaking loose. You know, and to get between the shot, but he's letting loose with the shot. I would find out later, you know, 12 against shotgun, buckshot. Um, but his poor dogs were just getting, I mean, slaughtered. To, to, to hear them getting their, getting eviscerated like that was just, just awful. So my mom, you know, of course, is in panic mode right now. She calls the police. Now, where we lived, very rural. We had one township cop that was on duty during the day. And in the evening, the state police took second and third shift. So the state police are the ones that showed up. Um, you know, the cruisers went, you know, went up his little road up the on top of the hill where he lived. And my mom called my father at work. And, you know, of course, you know, frantic over what, it, you know, what was happening. And, you know, my dad didn't come home early, but he came home at his normal time because the cops were there and everything he was said was settled, settled down at that point. So my father came home the next day in the morning, his usual time. And he went, um, he, he, you know, informed us, my mom kept me home from school, by the way. Um, he, he informed us that, you know, he's going to go over and, and talk to the, or we just call him the hermit to keep the, it, it simple. <clears throat> Up on the slate court, he'll, he's going to go talk to the hermit and see what happened. So, you know, he starts walking across our, our field to go to the guy's driveway to, you know, to go up and see what, what, what ended up happening. So he, he um, as he's walking down there, I'm tagging along, but uh, he let me, as soon as we got to the edge of the property, he wouldn't let me go up. He made me go back to the house. So he disappears, walks up the hill. Um, uh, uh, some kind of tactical team showed up from the Pennsylvania State Police. It, it was, I guess, their version of their SWAT team or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, they went, they were parked on the road, and I don't know if they couldn't get their vehicles up the hill um, because the road was winding and really narrow. Um, I think some of them might have gone up, but um, very shortly after that, they landed their helicopter in our field. Um, but, you know, some time went on and so forth. And uh, then a, a lot of small arms fire. Um, you, you know, you could tell it was, you know, I'm older now knowing what I know because I grew up hunting, fishing, shooting. You know, these were definitely right, high power rifle shots versus, you know, uh, versus a shotgun. Mm. And, you know, my dad ended up coming, you know, but, well, before that happened, um, before my dad came back down the hill to the house, <clears throat> the helicopter took off. It hovered up over the gentleman's property. Um, it lowered some kind of a, a net, you know, with some kind of grappling hooks or whatever. And when it when it finally ended up taking off, and there was something pretty large, and the net was covered up with tarpaulins or whatever something big was hanging in that when they took off and they flew away with it. Um, my father ended up coming back down to the house and, um, again, it's early in the morning. He just worked third shift. The, the, he comes and you know, sits us down and he said, listen, the, the you know, police said we shouldn't really you know, talk about this. And I, of course I'm, I'm five years old. I'm like that. What, what's going on? What happened? You know, my mom is like, yeah, you know, my mom was actually uh, really angry about the whole situation because, you know, she's scared to death and she, they weren't telling us what, what, what the hell was going on and so forth. So my, my dad said, um, he said, well, they shot and killed a very, very, very large wolf. And, and uh, I said, Dad, I said, you know, is that the, you know, the one that we saw the other day? 
And he, he said, well, it came down off this property. I'm going to say it was the one, you know, we saw there the other day. But truthfully, we really didn't know. We didn't even know that one was there, you know, let, let alone if there's more up there. Um, because the, the, the quarry holes were filled with fish. For some reason, you know, they get fish in them. I mean, big, huge bass and so forth. And, uh, you know, so there was a, a food source besides fish, deer, a lot of white tail deer in the area, tons of cornfields. They were big, fat deer. Um, oddly enough, my dad would make a comment um, that, uh, you know, he didn't really see too many deer running around as fall came when, you know, when he was finishing working on the house. So that was a little strange coincidence. But, you know, now this might have been the reason why this thing was harvested and probably most of what was around because of how big it was. But, you know, so he, he said that. So we're sitting down at the table and he said that, that, you know, he saw them shooting a really large wolf and that were, you know, we were asked not to talk about it and so forth. And then uh, he also said, you know, that, that there were, he said there were 12 gauge shotgun, spent shotgun shells everywhere, Jeff, everywhere. And the, the, the gentleman lost about nine of his 12 dogs. They were, they were killed pretty much instantly. They were, you know, ripped to shreds. That's what he would, he didn't, he didn't get too graphic because you got to remember, I'm only five years old at this point. You know, he said that they, they were just all torn apart. Um, the dogs that survived were, you know, injured to a degree too. He, he didn't really go into detail about that, but you know, he had that look in his eye again. He's, you know, you could just tell it. They frightened him. And the only time I ever saw fear in the man's eyes, I mean, I'm now 52. He's 74. Um, I tried to bring it up to him one other time, you know, when, when uh, I was, you know, probably in my teens, you know, before college about, you know, us seeing this thing and, and, uh, he kind of blocked it out. In my opinion, he, 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 he didn't comment or acknowledge that I was, you know, really, that I was asking him about this, you, you know, he, he just, he, he said something like, you know, you're talking about that black wolf thing. And I said, yeah, dad, like, you know, it's like things like he shut it down. He didn't want to talk about it. So I knew right then and there that that was, you know, that was something that really got to him right. and, and really frightened him. But, um, you know, I, I got to tell you, hearing those dogs get ripped to shreds was was awful. No. <clears throat> it, was, it was awful. From your house uh, to this guy's property, how how far would you say it was? Okay, from our house to the guy's property, um, the guy's property, okay, so that would be northbound. Um, to his property, it was probably, probably less than 100 yards to where his property started off the road. Oh. Now, to, to go up the hill on top of the refuse piles where he lived, mm -hmm. um, again, I want to clarify, the woods reclaimed these slate quarries because they were unused for a long, long time. So it's not, just, it's not that he's just living on a slate ref. It's all wooded at this point. Right. Um, it probably, and I would say maybe, uh, maybe a hundred yards total to where his house was on top of the, on top of the hill. Um, but his property started right across the street from our property. And there was a, a Creek that was fed by the springs coming out of the slate quarries. Um, so, you know, it was relatively close. And again, out in the country where we were noise, it, it was like a concert hall mm -hmm. sound, unfortunately. It was a, a really unnerving. It, it, it was really unnerving. I, I, I still sometimes get PTSD when, when I talk about this because, uh, um, I got on the, the story, my, my son, was my my wife is a mental health therapist and and she had a, a piece of corrugated uh pipe about four inches and it and accordions open and closed my son was playing with that a couple uh, actually it was only about six months ago and he he came up behind me you know, as i was sitting in the chair at the table 
and he he growled into this thing and it amplified it you know so much it 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 triggered me i i started shaking and and sweating and and i i immediately i turned around and knocked the chair over and i was like you know, and i i i was looking around for something to be there and uh, and i said angela you know please don't he's like dad are you okay are you okay and i said yeah i said you know it, it just reminds me of a really bad experience i had you know one time but uh you know it's not something that if if I could wish that it didn't happen, uh, I would. Right, right. Because it's, it's not something, oh, my God, to, you, to hear those dogs, deaf, to hear those animals get, the dogs, his dogs get slaughtered like that. Yeah. Well, I mean. After the slaughter happened, did you ever talk to the old guy after, or did your family talk with him ever? Well, my father had gone up there the morning after everything happened. Um, you know, he saw all the, you know, the dead dogs and the, the ones that were injured and so forth. Um, now, if you're, ask, or you're, you're asking me, like, after that initial encounter happened, did we ever associate with him again after that? Yeah. Um, you know what? Not really. And he was like, he was a hermit for a reason. He was, he lived up there on his own. Um, I don't know what the story was, honestly. He wasn't a real friendly, talkative guy. Okay. Um, he would wave if you saw him on the road, um, you know, if you're walking or, and he'd see it, he'd wave, but that's really about it. I mean, he never came over to talk to my father or say hi to him or anything like that. And we never went over to visit him. He, he, he uh, he isolated himself okay. from ever from everybody. And, you know, he had the properties of a beautiful property, but, you know, he was always, he was always in, in the process of fighting, you know, keeping trespassers away. Um, I'm guilty of going swimming in that those quarry holes too. Not the one where the beach was at, but uh, that's the one. But not the other one. The other ones had sheer drop offs, hundreds of feet. So you know, I mean, a couple people drowned over the years because they trespassed and they and they they did you know they poked their nose around where they shouldn't have been and they fell in these holes and drowned. But no, he was not. He was not a friendly guy. You know, and he he. Uh, I don't even know how old he lived to. He did eventually pass away, um, but he, he stayed secluded. He stayed. He was a recluse, I guess. He was just really reclusive. Okay. Wow. Yeah, that's. I mean, I couldn't imagine. You know, your dad just being freaked out. You seeing your dad freaked out in the car, and then I can't imagine his demeanor coming back after going up there and seeing the, you know, the carnage of these dogs, you know, being shredded. It must have been horrific for your dad to see, you know, and his whole yeah. attitude must have just been, you know, really off-putting knowing that, hey, we just built this house here, you know. <laughs> I, I'm working. My my wife's a stay home mom, and my kids are young. I mean, that's... third shift too. Working third yeah. shift as him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, God, that must have been horrifying. Yeah, he listen. He he definitely was shaken. You know, um, he put a game face on for us kids and his and his, and his wife. But I mean, he definitely was was shaken up, and uh, you know. It, geez, you know, when you look at your dad, my dad was, I was five years old, my dad was Superman. Yeah. You know, he was my hero, you know. So uh, later, I, I I wanted to just bring this up to us, like later, later that, you know, later that night, um, we were supposed, I was supposed to be in bed, but I heard my, you know, my parents talk and my dad and mom were talking a little bit further about it. And, you know, he was telling my mom a little bit more details, you know, about what happened up there. And, you know, he, he, you know, he didn't get into the gore with me. I, I, I heard it from, from him, uh, 
talking to my mom and of course I'm supposed to be sleeping, but no, I'm eavesdropping because I'm only the next room over from their bedroom. Right. You know, and he just, he just told my mom, you know, that the dogs were literally ripped apart, you know, that, um, that the guy actually was, you know, he was practically ready to be committed at this point. My dad said he couldn't, he wasn't even coherent. He couldn't even talk coherently. Mm. You know, that's how scared he was. And he was, he was letting loose with his 12 gauge out one of his windows. Um, you know, I don't know how, I don't know how well the property was lit up because I was never up there. I was a little kid, um, at night. So, but my father said, you know, he, he was just blasting away. You know, he just, there were, he said there were just shells everywhere. Spent shotgun mm -hmm. shells. Wow. And, you know, the, and the dog, you know, he, he told my mom, you know, flat out the dogs were ripped apart and, you know, it was very scary. My, he, there were loaded shotguns the next day at that, you know, the back door and the front door, you know, with, with, with double, with double lot magnum buckshot, I could tell you that much. And, you know, he got my mom a handgun, you know, to, you know, for, you know, for her to give her, she came to shove. And, uh, you know, I'll tell you this much. He wasn't on third shift very long after this happened. Right. You know, my mom was like, you're, my mom was like, you're, you, you're getting, you got to get off third shift. I, I can't be alone with something like this, you know, going on. Who could blame her? You know? Yeah. Who could blame her? But, um, you know, thank God, Jeff. Like I said, I think about, you know, that all the time is, you know, we were walking around on that property just a couple of days beforehand. Geez, I don't even want to think about what the, what the outcome would have been like if that thing ran down into us on foot. Wow. I mean, that's, and you, the thing is, is when you, and I kind of want to emphasize this sure. because, you know, for people that are hearing this, you know, you said from head tip of the nose to tip of the tail, it was, you know, 20 feet long. But when you and your dad saw this thing that was when it was standing bipedal, your dad measured that branch, you and your dad, and it was 12 feet tall. This was just, this This thing was a monster of a dog, man. It was just absolutely gigantic. There's no, listen, there's no other way to describe it. It was freaking gigantic. I mean, mm. you know, I mean, the, the the county road, it just it was a small two two lane county road, you know, no yellow line in the middle. But it had the fog line on both sides, you know, and it, like I said, from tip of the nose to tip of the tail, it 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 went from shoulder to shoulder on the on the county road. It, it, Jeff, it was it was enormous. It's like I said, its canines were had to be six inches. They were huge. They, they were huge. Yeah. Wow. The things the things had was enormous. I mean, it's four foot. It's roughly. Like I said, he took a measurement. Um, the car was like three feet. The top of the hood and the shoulder was about a foot above that. I mean, the, the four foot at the shoulder, this animal was... Those dogs was, stood no chance. Yeah. I, I mean, I, they, they sure didn't. I mean, the way uh, you describe the head, the head just, you know, it's almost like the, the head of this creature was the size of one of those dogs almost. You know, it was... It was, it was huge. It's a, it's an incredible experience, and I, wow, I cannot imagine being a father, you know, and you you being a dad now. I can't sure. imagine the just the uh, amount of fear and uh, regret. You know, I mean, there's got to, you know what I mean? Like, I can't believe we just built this house here. I don't have money to move. We got to live this out. He, you know, it's just, that's terrifying. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was terrifying. Trust me. And, you know, it, well, to, you know, to, to, to compound matters. Okay. The, the, um, the barracks commander from the local state police barracks, yeah. right in the same, you know, um, he, talk to my dad and he said, you know, I'm going to come down and, and talk to you after this is all cleared up up here and uh you know he came down and my mom you know made him coffee and they sat down and 
and talked and stuff like that. And, you know, of course, I'm a little kid. I got shushed off into the room. <laughs> but I have big, you know, big ears. Yep. You know, and, he, you know, he, he told my father in no unspoken terms, he said, you know, it just would be better if you didn't never talk never talked about this again just don't ever bring it up again right you know we took care you know the animal was like i said when my dad went up there there was a tactical team that had arrived you know small arms fire broke out which again now as an adult i know the difference between a high power rifle report and a shotgun you know they were definitely high power rifle rounds that, you know I don't know how many rounds it took to kill the thing, but they, um, I could tell you this, they did unload on it. You know, yeah. there was quite, quite a bit of gunfire. Wow. So, and then my dad, you know, he, he said that they killed in a, a very, very large wolf. So, uh, you yeah. know, he actually saw them shoot it when he was up there. That's incredible. But, uh, it incredible. Yeah. I, I'll tell you the, the, the constitution that that man, I, I can't even imagine yeah, I mean that he because he had to be strong for me because I saw the thing with him and you know his wife who was terrified you know me also now after that happened mm -hmm. you know I was a, I guess maybe you know it didn't quite tear me to pieces you know at that age because you know it was still really surreal to me yeah it's almost like you're not registering it you know it's yeah it, it, that's i couldn't have said it any better myself that's exactly what i was thinking that type of it was like you know oh wow it was a huge wolf and it killed nine guard dogs and they shot it with like however many rounds it took to kill it the you know um the guy that owned the, the the hermit that owned the property you know like i said i mean my dad said like he was not even close. He was like not coherent when he was up there. Mm. And how could you blame the guy? Yeah. There was there was some huge black wolf uh, tearing, you know, just tearing your dogs to pieces. And you're, uh, you know, he, I guess, you know, he was shooting out the window to try and hit this thing. I don't even know if if he hit it. I, you know, my dad didn't wouldn't, didn't know either, but. You know, I don't even know if they hit, he hit the thing. I mean, he probably did because, you know, he's just shooting everywhere in the dark and, you know, where he's hearing noises and stuff like that, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, but I can't imagine what he went through. And, you know, my dad, like I said, he had to keep a game face on. And it, it, with me, it didn't, but you're right. I think that's how I would I, I would put it. That it kind of didn't register out the, right. the you know, serious. It was very surreal at the time. Yeah. But when you know, I started, re you know, getting into, you know, reading stuff about cryptids on YouTube, and I came across, you know, your channel primarily is what, you know, is where I learned, you know, what what I had actually seen, and and uh, you know, this was uh, about six years ago, seven years ago. So I'm like 45 at the time. And when I'm reading, you know, the research and the reports and the interviews, when I realized that this is what my father and I had seen, and I mean, I got like, uh, I got PTSD from it. I mean, I, I was shaking, I was sweaty, my hairs of the hair were standing up on the back of my head. You know, I kind of relived it to a minimal amount, but it's still enough. It, it scared the shit out of me. Yeah, yeah. Why you wouldn't know? it? Why wouldn't it? You know. I mean, I remember when I narrated that <clears throat> and, you know, I thought about how your dad felt and, and how, you know, the family, your family felt. But I remember what I remember thinking about the old guy, the hermit. And, and I was like, this poor man literally went through hell one night, lost his dogs, but then had to endure, you know, the, watching this tactical team, so, you know, the, the, never in a million years would you ever guess that this would happen. This tactical team come and kill this enormous creature on your property. I mean, it, definite PTSD and, you know, it's almost... <laughs> 
and then he had to endure it mentally for you know however long he he lived after that is almost unbelievable you know just i couldn't i really was like wow this guy really went through hell multiple times within a 24 hour period of time yeah you got you got that right too too many wars pretty much yeah and you know again you know the guy was an older guy you know again he was a hermit i i i wish i could give you more information you know about him or what happened to him after the incident but i you know i i just can't because number one like i said he wasn't friendly with with anybody he kept to himself he was very reclusive Mm -hmm. um you know he never came over our house for a cup of coffee he never invited you know my parents over for a cup of coffee he'd see you on the road when he drove down off the hill off his uh off the hill he lived you know off the off the hill he lived on and he'd wave but that's it he he wasn't a real social person i mean i i don't even know if he had any family that was kids or anybody um that was able to come and you know help him get through this or, or whatever because i didn't notice any different cars or people or hear anything um you know really so i I don't even know what happened you know what happened to the guy after all this went down i mean you know i know i know he's long dead as of now he was an old man back then you know so I, i honestly wish i could give you more information on that but you know again like the whole thing was somewhat surreal to me because of my age and absolutely and you know after you know learning about what i saw by you know listening you know to the videos and and the the research he had done on on this topic it just it hit me because it's something i kind of you know i kind of shelved in my mind for a long time yeah it's amazing what our brains do to cope with you know things we just really just you know uh stuff things away and and forget about it you know until we have that reminder or whatever you know it could be you know just a maybe you seeing a shotgun shell one day could have brought it up you know or or something you know and it's it's incredible that our brain deals with stress and trauma that way and then it's almost like once you realize that that happened, holy crap, that really did happen. You're an instant PTSD going, wow, that was real. That really was a monster, you know? And it's, it's scary. It is scary. Well, you know, like I said, I tried bringing it up to my father, um, you know, uh, uh, years after that, you know, to give you some, you know, idea, I mean, a rural area, I was out, I would learn how to shoot when I was in the Idaho, grasshopper, fish, hunt, you know, all that stuff. Going through life and, you know, my dad and I used to shoot rifle, high power rifle competitively as a father and son team, you know, doing these kinds of things, nothing ever you know, the, you know, hunting, you know, the, the gunfire, you know, nothing triggered me more than reading the research and understanding finally what I saw. Mm. Now, I'm glad my dad made a good decision. I, I'm I'm not too macho to, to say that. I'm glad he didn't let me go with him because I, I don't know as a five-year-old kid, if I would have seen all those dogs with their bowels all torn out all over the place, their heads all, you know, decapitated, you know, torn apart, you know, I loved animals. We had dogs that probably would have really screwed me up. Yeah. You know, you know, and then the, then all the high power rifle fire to kill the animal, you know, I mean, uh, I mean, he made a really good decision. He he made a really good decision. And and as far as my dad goes, I mean, I gotta give him kudos for having the brasses balls out of anybody 
I know to to keep his you know he had to keep that game face on he couldn't show fear you know he only I only got a glimpse of fear you know, from from being in the car when he looked at me and I looked at him and we realized well, holy shit we're see, we are seeing this you know yeah and then after yeah. you know he came down when my mom questioned him about what he saw up there and you know you know, he, he had a little fear in his eyes at that point too, even though it was dead. Um, but like I said, Jeff, you no, know, we didn't know this guy owned a hundred acres of raw woods. Mm-hmm. You know, we didn't know what else was up there. You know, we didn't know if there were more of these. Yeah. Things. That's what I was thinking with your dad, you know, thinking, you know, okay, they got this one, but what, what the hell else is up in those woods? Well, they, we didn't know at the time. We, we did not know. The only, the only thing, like I said to you, the odd part was my dad had made a comment that going into the fall when the house was fin- being finished, he's, he just thought it was funny. We didn't see a lot of white-tailed deer because we had a five-acre field. You know, which had um, at the time, I think, I don't know if it had corn in it or if it was just alfalfa, but the, the you know, mm-hmm. he made a comment that we weren't really seeing a whole lot of deer in the field or crossing from, you know, like I said, cornfield across the street, woods. I can't remember. I think I think the our field was hay at this time, but you know, the, the, it was part of a truck farm at one time, so there were all kinds of berries. They, they never tilled the bushes under so we had you know raspberries you know mulberry trees you know black raspberries red raspberries boysenberries blackberries strawberries blueberry bush you name it um you know we would have thought the deer would have been all over eating these berries and stuff like that but he you know he, he made a comment and it was odd we didn't see any lot of deer running around yeah absolutely so i mean we never thank god we there was never another incident to my, it's at least to my knowledge, right? You know, involved in one of these one of these things, but um, it listen, it, it was big enough and uh, strong enough and fast enough that you know I don't think anything could have ever muscled it out of its territory. Let's put it that way, right? Um, uh, it's just we were just in awe that something like this actually existed, or even you know we. You know, that's let alone living across the street. Yeah. But, you know, that it even existed. It was, it was a really rude awakening to the fact that, you know, human beings aren't the top of the food chain. No, you know? definitely not. You know, so, but that was, uh, you know, that was pretty much a wrap on that. And again, yeah. you know, I, I tried to get my dad, tried to get my dad to comment on it in later years. Um, and you know, he just kind of like, just was like, Oh, you know, that was that black wolf thing or whatever. And he just shut right. He just, he said a couple of words. That was all that was about that black wolf thing and shut right down. And that was it. And he, he refused, he didn't, he refused to talk about it. He didn't, he, he didn't say, I'm not talking about it. He just, he shut me down after he said that. And that was it. So I, I knew it was still, I knew it bothered him. Right. You know, absolutely. Um, but well, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're coming on some time. We got about 20 minutes left. Um, okay. I know you got some, you got a Bigfoot experience or something like that. You had yeah. told me. Yeah, we, absolutely. I got uh, two of them and I'll, I'll make these quick for you. If that's, if that's what you want. Yeah. Um, I, I want to hear them. Definitely. Okay, the the first one, um, the first one, we did not see the Sasquatch. Okay, okay. my father and I, I was about uh, probably um, about thirteen or fourteen, and I was older than about sixteen. Um, so we're talking about like nineteen eighty six um, in Carbon County, Pennsylvania, Northeast Pennsylvania, Carbon County. Um, we were hunting on an eighty six uh, acre piece of land that my my aunt my father's sister had bought and it was virgin woods yet um it ran it was like a rectangle rectangle picture a rectangle so the country this it was on a country road there was no shoulder to speak of so we just had to pull over and get out of the car and it was like a little incline just to get up on the property and then it was fairly steep up 
climb up the mountain. On the top of this, on top of the ridge, though, was a, a Pennsylvania State game land. So we were walking. We got out of the car. It's about 4.30, 4 o'clock in the morning. Um, I have, we both have our, our quintessential Pennsylvania deer rifles. I had a Marlin 30-30. My dad had his Marlin 35. We both had our Rue 44 Magnum sidearms. And, uh, you know, we were walking in the middle of pitch blackness. There was nothing out there. No light of any kind. And, I know you, you're kind of familiar with being out in the country, Jeff. I mean, where there's no light pollution from any city or anything like that. I mean, it's black, black. Yeah. I mean, just black. So as we were, we were walking now, it was a pretty cold deer season. Um, the, um, there was a lot of dead fall on the ground, a lot of dead leaves, you know, the deciduous leaves from the, you know, the oak and the maple, you know, crunch, crunch, crunch. On, you know how that goes under your feet. You step, if you step on a dead limb when it's really cold like that, a dead tree branch, you know, it snaps with authority. Yeah, it's loud. It's loud as hell. So, you know, we're walking along, and I said to my father, I said, I said, you know, Dad, I said, something's, I hear something to our, left rear of us off to the left but to the rear because i'm he's walking in front of me and i'm walking behind him it's slow going there's lots of rocks a lot of dead tree limbs you know like i said it's virgin wilderness and he said uh, he didn't hear it because it was kind of windy um at the at first when when we started you know initially started the walk at the bottom it was windy so I said, okay, maybe I'm hearing things. Now we have black bear, and there was a, a big black bear boar that was seen on this property, and he was huge. Um, but, you know, anybody that knows anything about bears, they, they walk very silently. They're very quiet. Yeah. Um, so, and this thing was definitely on two feet. You could hear, you could hear the spacing, you know, a footfall, a footfall, a footfall. So I heard it again. And I said, Dad, well, you, did you hear that this thing? He goes, no, not really. You know, and I said, something is ghosting us. It's behind us to the left, you know. And, and, I, and I said, here's what I want to do. I said, we, I took both our flashlights and I looked ahead just to see where we could go that wasn't too full of obstructions. So I said, Dad, I just, you got to humor me here. Let's, let's run like 10 or 20 feet stop but run and stop something some things definitely coming up behind us here so we ran about 20 he, he placated me and we ran about 20 feet and we stopped okay the footfalls behind us did not stop when we stopped so my little trick worked and he said now i hear it and um Somewhere along the line, uh, a, a pretty thick dead tree branch was stepped on, and it it was it had to be a big thick one. But whatever stepped on it had to be really heavy like, to boot because it sounded like a bomb going off. I mean, it was very loud. Mm. So I, you know, my father obviously heard that, and and I said, Dad, I said, something, there's something really big coming up coming up on us over here so he's like well you know what do you want to do you know and, and he looked a little concerned but not very he was still trying to push it off that it was, he was like it's just a bear just a bear and i kept telling him it wasn't a bear but you know so there were there were three trees in the area we were that were real close that were right next to where we were at so i said let's go over there put our backs up, but there's a tree in the middle, can't get through here. Just, you stand back here with your back against this tree, and I'll stand with my back against the other tree. We'll face ourselves down the way this thing is coming, you know, and, I, and it could have been a person. He said, you know, you could be a person looking to rob us or something like that, which I never thought of, but I said, but I said, you know what, there's no freaking way that that was a person that stepped on that branch because you could tell Jeff was way too big and thick when it, the way it broke. Right. It was extremely loud. No human being would have been able to, to do that. So 
I call. I said, I'm going to call out. There's nothing else left to do. So I drew my 44 Magnum and I said to my dad, I said, you're better off having your 44 Magnum at the ready. That's it's more powerful than the rifles that we had, you know? Mm-hmm. So I called out, I said, Hey, is there anybody there? You know, and the footfalls didn't, didn't stop. I said, oh, please stop and now announce yourself. You know, we're armed. We don't want any trouble. We don't want anybody to hurt. We don't want to hurt anybody. We don't want to get hurt. You know, could you please call out and tell us who you are? It says private property. We have a relative, a relative that owns it. We're allowed to be here. You're not. So please stop and call out. That didn't do it either. So after I got done, you know, saying my little spiel there to try and get the person to speak up, which I got to be honest with you, Jeff, I was hoping it was a person at this, you know, yeah. I, even, even though there's no way it was because I allowed that tree branch broke. So um, then something really scary happened. The footfalls went from a, from a slow walk to a, a all out run, you know, a full bore run. Mm-hmm. And you could tell whatever was coming through the woods was huge. I mean, it sounded like a bowling ball. What would a bowling ball would sound like if you're whipping it through the woods? I mean, it was, you know, there was all kinds of things breaking. You could hear things in. So I, I, I said, dad, I'm going to, I'm going to let a round go. So he said, aim and I, so you don't kill. So, so you know, <laughs> I got my four, I had my 44 Magnum out. I aimed tree, you know, not quite treetop height because I didn't want it to go too far. And I ripped off a round for my 44 Magnum. I ripped right off uh 44 Magnum. The footfalls stopped. And I said, please stop or announce yourself. You know, I was, I was really, you know, announce yourself, announce yourself. I, you know, I just, I just shot a bullet in the air at you, you know, and the footfalls didn't, they didn't stop, but uh, I mean, they stopped, but they didn't start going back toward us again. When, you know, after I let the shot go, they came to a stop and then I tried to get them a call out again and they didn't. And I said, okay, you know, you're going to, you know, we're armed. You're going to get shot if you keep pursuing us. And they actually, you know, ended up going the other direction. I guess, I guess they figured that, you know, they didn't, they didn't want to tangle with us at that point since we met, you know, but you know, it was, I, I could tell you whatever it was, was definitely thinking it over like what to do because it didn't turn around and run away right away. Right. You know, I was asking for somebody to call out, please announce yourself. Cause we didn't want to hurt anybody and we didn't want to get hurt. Um, but that's, I'm positive that had to be a Sasquatch because of the noise of the branch when it was broken, um, just the heavy footfalls. I mean, maybe I'm not, I could be incorrect. Maybe it wasn't, but it was bipedal for sure. And from what I know about bears, they're quiet, you know, so um, no human being either, unless they were Andre the Giant, maybe. Right. Could have stepped on a branch like that, but that was the first Sasquatch encounter. It's nothing hair. Well, it was hair raising at the time. Let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, you're, you're something's there, and you know something's there. So, <laughs> yeah, it was it was scary. It was scary at the time, and you know, you kind of laugh, you know laugh at yourself, you know, a little bit, you know, because you have to, to make yourself feel a little better, feel a little bit more, you know, like, you you don't want to sound like, you know, you were scared shitless, but you really were, you know? Right. Absolutely. Um, the other sad, this is the second Sasquatch encounter I have that, that this one is pretty scary actually. Um, so at this point, I'm 22, I'm, uh, that's 1992 and my girlfriend, for County, uh, west of Tawanda, about 20 minutes. Um, and, uh, it's 350 acres and it's right off of route 220. Um, it runs straight up the mountain. Again, you can picture it as a rectangle basically. 
Um, not, it's not quite that pure of a shape, but from the county road, it goes all the way up the mountain to where the state game lands are at in this area, too. It was logged out um, quite a while ago. And, um, you know, so there were logging, you know, there were skitter roads everywhere where they logged out the, you know, the valuable hardwoods and stuff like that. So my, my current, uh, my mom's brother, um, was the legacy to own the property from his uncle, but my great uncle, my mom's, uh, you know, great uncle, so to speak. I'm trying not to confuse everybody. We have such a big family, <laughs> but, but, but anyway, so the lodge is like a big it's like a viking law it's it's center block modern you know it looked like a bar a military barracks it was you know like 100 feet by 40 feet a big center block building uh you know you walked in you had a mud room where of course there were there were beer meisters everywhere it's deer camp right. you know first day of deer camp in pa you get drunk and play uh, poker all night long. Yeah. So uh, I, I really was never a big drinker. So, but I, I did play a lot of cards. So, you know. So we we have a couple work weekends, one in the spring and one in the fall. So I had gone up and and participated in the work weekends. So my my room, uh, I mean, uh, my meals were all free for for participating in the work weekend um and if you did them both you got free board you know for the first uh, week of deer season so if you did them both you got free room and board for the first week with you know with your food so um my uh, you know my uncle we went uh I don't know, it's a mile or two um you go straight up the mountain and then the the first branch off where the, the logging road is the first one you come to and you go all the way I, you know what i'm sorry i don't know distances but i went to all the way i went probably about two miles total from the cabin okay um up the mountain and then across the property so to say north first and then west to the end of the logging road my my uncle had two deer stands. He had one there, and he had another one that was about another half a mile up the up the up the ridge. So the the you know he thinks he's building skyscrapers here. The, the, this deer stand, Jeff, is like twenty feet off the ground. No kidding. <laughs> um, at your feet, okay. And it's in it's in a bir it's in the crotch of a birch tree that has three prongs to it. Okay. So I tied my gun up to the to the rope that you pull it up with so you don't shoot yourself and you know i climb up in this thing and it's still dark mind you so on the on the on the logging road side it's like 20 feet off the ground but on the opposite side where it goes over the ridge it's like 50 feet off the ground because there's like a kind of a real good drop off right there. Mm -hmm. So I'm up in this thing and this thing, I feel like I'm on a damn amusement ride because it was very windy. Okay. And, and, and this, this thing is just shot, shove it's shoving around, shoving me around, you know, it's moving one way, moving the other way, moving this way. And I'm like, I'm like, I got to get off this damn thing. I'm going to get thrown out of the deer stand and get killed because I'm getting, I'm, I'm going to get thrown out of the deer stand, you know, which happens. A lot of people do die from falling out of their deer stands, mm -hmm. you know, and this was very windy and I was sober there. I was hundred percent sober. Didn't even have it. think anything to drink the night before. Um, I was just playing cards. And, uh, you know, so I tied myself to one of the tree one of the offshoots around my waist so at least i wouldn't get thrown off the damn deer stand but it was like i felt like i was on the i on the ocean and i'm like i i got it i don't get motion sickness but this was it, this was more annoying than than you know anything so i lowered my rifle and i climbed back down i i i was told you know by the the the, the board or the the old we call them the old, the old guys, the ones that were the, you know, the board and everything that kept everything running, paid the bills and kept the property that at the end of the logging road on that side of the property, that, that would have been the, uh, east side of the property. 
um, there, that there was like another hundred yards till you got to the boundary of the next hunting lodge's property. And, you know, there were marked, there were posted markers. So you'll see posted markers. You'll see, you know, oranges. They had it, they had the barriers um, on trees where you could see where it ended. You know, it was either posted signs or ribbons or I forget exactly. But now this is all like virgin forest. So I'm, I'm walking, I'm going to say north, say northeast. So I went up the ridge as well as across the ridge to the east a little bit. So I'm going like northeast and it's, it's virgin woods. I mean, the rhododendrons are 12 feet tall. There's mountain laurel all, all over the place. The, 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 you know, the, the, carn, the coniferous trees are, you know, the, the temperature and the light coming in was actually, you know, um, I'm, you know, I'm having a brain fart here. How to put this? The light coming in from the sun was actually inhibited because the trees were so everything was so thick. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it was it was mm-hmm. the temperature dropped. It was a little cooler um, in this area. It was a little darker. I mean, it, it, you know, it, it felt kind of creepy. And I had to bushwhack a little bit too. Every you know, as I'm going through, there's vines and sticker bushes and you know all that kind of stuff. The 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 bush that the guy made velcro from from those little things that stick you know what i'm talking about they stick all over you yeah you know so you know i'm i finally got to a place where i felt comfortable i saw a couple of deer trails and there was a big tree now the deer trails were going up the mountain to the north and then one wide to the east and one wide to the west (laughs) and if you can picture above the letter y there was a big tree and I sat my ass down right out in front of that big tree. And I was about 20 or 30 feet from where both of these uh, trails emerged, you know, out of the brush. As I'm looking down the mountain in my ride, I had a 30, my 3006 with me with 180 round nose. Um, you know, that's what I brought because I was going to be in the brush. You know, uh, you know, so I didn't bring a, you know, a, you know, like a, a more ballistic tip bullet or higher power shell. But if I would have known what I know and I would have had my seven millimeter Magnum with me, um, you know, for, for this incident, but you know, hindsight's 2020. Right. So I'm, you know, I'm look, I looked for my scope. I saw some deer coming up. They crossed the road and were going to come up the mountain. Um, there was a, about uh, six or seven and there was a, a nice big buck in there and the, the, you know, the does were leading the way. And as I just, you know, I got patient. I had deer lure, buck lure. Um, I don't know if you ever use that when you were, if you ever went hunting and used buck lure, No. but it's basically dope piss. Yeah. Excuse yeah. my language. Um, uh, I inadvertently kicked it and knocked it over and it, I stunk like a skunk. I mean, I had it all over my boots and everything like that. And, uh, the wind, interestingly enough was I was down, uh, down the mountain was down when the wind was coming down over there, over the ridge. So I'm like, Oh boy, the, the, the deer are going to catch my scent. So that's, I was like, hopefully not with all those buck lure all over the place. And that stuff stinks. It really does. Yeah. So, uh, to my, which would have been more the, the more easterly branch of the Y, to my left, the first couple doe emerged. They came out from the brush, you know, and I'm, I'm just, um, I'm sitting there, I'm a left-handed guy, so with a right-handed rifle. So I'm, I'm just slowly, because I couldn't afford to buy a left-handed rifle at the time, you know. So, you know, I'm, I'm easing safety off, you know, getting my eye up to the scope. the take aim and I had like a sniper set up. I had open sights underneath the raised, raised mounts for the scope. And I, and you know, I went down to open sights then cause I should getting a lot closer. I'm like, okay, come on, stick your head out. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting and waiting and waiting for the buck to come out. One doe comes out, two does come out, three does come out. They stop and they start snorting and, and digging at the earth 
and you know making you know you know just making a racket they turn around and like a jeff bat out of hell go flying back down the mountain so i put my scope up it was about 300 yards plus i put my scope up just to watch to see if the buck came out he did I put it about two two feet above his head, or I should say his antlers. I ripped the shot off, but it, it hit the dirt right behind him. The bullet was too too heavy and not fast enough for that kind of a distance. That, hence is where I said I wish I would have had my seven millimeter magnum because I would have dropped that dropped him. That thing was very long and flat shooting. So I'm <clears throat> I'm sitting there and you know I, I rechambered it around just in case another you know just in case. So I'm I'm sitting there and. And um, it dawned on me that the does that were came out to my left <clears throat> weren't looking at me. It just kind of hit me. What, like, I'm like, wait a minute, they weren't even looking at me. But they, I thought they, because I, I thought they smelled me because they started digging the earth, you know, snorting and clawing at the or clawing at the earth and all that kind of stuff. You know, I thought it was the jig was up. Right. But I was just thinking about it and how they acted and everything like that. And and I'm like, something isn't right here because they weren't looking at me. They were looking over my left shoulder. And so I craned my neck around the tree I was sitting against. Behind me, <clears throat> at an angle, again, to like the northeast a little bit, um, there was a stand of, of big pine trees. And well, I, as soon as, you know, I turned around and, and I'm... I'm looking at something. I'm not sure what I'm seeing here, but there was a dark reddish brownish uh, leg that was obstructed in the pine trees. I, you know, you could see from the knee down to the foot. I'm not sure which leg it was, but it, this, it was. I knew it was a Sasquatch right away because what else would it be? It's, you know. I'm sitting. I'm sitting on the ground, and this thing, this thing's knee is higher than the top of my head. Um, I didn't smell anything, but again, I was downwind from. Uh, I was. Uh, he was downwind from me. <clears throat> I never. No, I was downwind from him. I'm sorry. No, I was downwind from him. I didn't smell anything. People say that they get like a real uh, nauseating stench or something when they're around these things. Um, I didn't see, I didn't smell that at all. Um, you know, I didn't smell it. Jeff, are you still there? Yeah, I'm listening. Oh, I'm sorry. Something, something went wacky on my phone here. I didn't smell anything, but again, it was very, very windy. Um, you know, it, it's, it's hair was, you know, you could see it was blowing around a little bit from the wind and it would have like a, a nice, you know, like a golden glisten to it and everything like that. And, and I'm, you know, and uh, Jeff, I got to tell you, this thing's leg looked like it was almost as thick as the friggin' tree, tree trunk. I mean, it was, it was, it was enormous. It was very large. Right. All I could, you know, all I could see was a basic shadow, you know, uh, up in the, up in the tree and where it was hiding. Um, and like I said, I only saw the side of its leg from like the knee down and I don't know what, you know, how big it was or how it got there. It could have been there already. I don't know if he was sleeping there and, and I didn't see him there because I came out in the dark, you know, or if he snuck down the mountain, you know, um, looking for food. Right. Because I know that there's there's also a couple big bears there on top of the mountain up there though in the game lands there's caves and there's caverns there's caves where some of the bears hibernate but there's other caves in the area and stuff like that. Me personally, I think he came down off from the state game lands. Honestly, probably living in one of the caves up there. Yeah. Um, that's what I'm assuming. You think uh, it was you know, following the deer down? I, I would say he probably came probably came down looking for a meal now here's here's the part that troubles me and i want to see what you think okay yeah i don't i i absolutely do not subscribe to the fact that these things sing kumbaya and play the flute with you when you meet one okay right um 
were a food source for this animal. And what ended up what ended up happening was when I turned my neck around and, and I saw his you know his leg there, and and he he definitely knew that I saw him because what happened next ne- nearly uh, you know made my heart stop. The next the next thing I I know is I, I you know the thing it, it, growl, it growled screamed whatever you want to call it. It let a hell of a, a you know I'm going to say it was more of a growl than a scream you know, but it was very loud. I could clearly hear it even though it was windy, and the son of a bitch started shaking the shit out of the tree he was standing you know behind. So I'm like. Okay, you know, I I had unholstered slowly unholstered my my forty four Magnum. At this point, I thought for everybody out there who's going to criticize me about this, I thought I was about to die right. because it, it this it was not there was nothing friendly about this, nothing at all. It, yeah. You could tell it was highly agitated and angry. I don't know if I was supposed to be the meal. I don't know if he was going to steal one of my deer if I shot one, you know. Yeah. But, but the deer, the, the food was gone, and I was the only thing left there. So I, I thought, honestly, in my heart, this thing was about to kill me. You yeah. know, he, he probably he probably would have stole If I shot a deer, Jeff, I think he just would have stole it and got it and, and, and been done with it. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, we've heard yeah. – I've heard – encounters where a a guy had a guy was hunting and he was posted up he was in a small clearing uh and he saw a a squatch coming through but it had a deer over its shoulders you know um yeah sure i maybe you know like you said that you wanted um my opinion maybe and you know i'm not an expert at all but Maybe the deer were initially the dinner, and he was real upset at you, you know, for being there. And maybe he shook the tree to get you out of there. Uh, because I mean, I think if you were if you were dinner for him, I don't think I don't think he would have just shook a tree. You know, I think he would have came for you. Cause, cause I, you know what? I don't think they're friendly at all, and I don't. I, I'm with you, and I've always been this way. I don't subscribe to the fact that Dogman, Bigfoot, Werewolf, whatever, are misunderstood, and you know they 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 just want to be friends. I don't believe that they want to be friends, and uh, you know I think that it's a uh, you're a lucky person if you get out of the woods alive if you see one. I, I agree, and, and like I said, I mean, now, now he he would have been hunting deer too because he obviously didn't know these deer were going to come up the mountain either. But he, you know, he was right near where deer deer trails intersect, just like where I planted myself. So yeah. he probably, I'm I'm going to say he hunted there before. He probably came back to, you know, you, you you go with what you know, what you're comfortable with. He could have very well swiped a few deer from there, you know, and 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 that's it. And nobody in the hunting uh, society uh, ever brought ever brought it up. So. Here's the, here's the, I think, honestly, if I wouldn't have been armed, I think I would, would have, I think he would have killed me because he, he was go he was going nuts. I mean, you know, ground, I, it wasn't really the scream that everybody talks about mm-hmm. that hits you in the chest. It was, it was just really demonic growls. That's the only way I could, you know, he right. shook the shit out of the tree. You know, I, I unholstered my 44. I actually, I, I, you know, I turned as far as I could. I actually, you know, was at a real bad angle, but I didn't want to expose myself any more than I, than I had to, because I felt he was going to charge me. I, I just turned around and I unloaded with the four, with my four, with my 44. I, I ripped off all six shots in his direction, I did not aim at him in, intentionally. 
Mm-hmm. You know, but I, I shot all six shots out of that. And I had some under uh, uh, Buffalo bore 350 grain overloads in that thing. So um, those things, they probably would have taken them down if I hit them all six times. But again, I did not aim at him. I aimed at off to the side of him. And that was part partly because I didn't want to expose myself. I didn't know what he was going to do. You know, so I didn't want to stick my head around the corner and have him pop it off my body. Yeah. You know, so I did that. I turned around, took a knee, reloaded my 44 Magnum, put it back in my holster. Uh, You know, I sat there with my 3006 chambered and just listened. You know, I mean, he definitely he, he took off like a bat out of hell because I heard I heard him running. I heard the carnage. Okay, at first. But then it stopped almost as quickly as it started. And again, it's very windy. Okay. And I'm in virgin forest here. So now I got to go. I got to go about 100 yards back to the main logging trail through all this stuff that I have. I have I'm, you know, I'm bushwhacking through. So I just, I'm going to be honest with you, you know, I prayed and I prayed and I prayed because I didn't think I was ever going to get out of there. You know, I, 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 I had my handgun in my hand, my rifle swung over my, my back, and I was just trying to get through that stuff as quickly as possible. I got back to the trail. You know, I took a knee, I took a knee again, and I just listened to see if I could figure out where he was. Because it was so windy, Jeff, I couldn't hear anything other than when he first bolted. You know, yeah. when he first bolted, but it stopped almost right away. And and I don't know if it's because he stopped. You know, maybe he was afraid I was pursuing him and was going to continue until I killed him. He might have thought that. I mean, I just unloaded a forty four Magnum toward him. Yeah. You know, I don't I don't know if he thought he was going to get killed and he he stopped to hide. But I don't know because I didn't see him after that. But. I I got to the logging road where the skitter road, and like I said, it was roughly about a mile out to the main road that the trail. These are trails, I should say, that went down the mountain to the cabin. So I never ran so fast in my life. You know, I I, I was like, I was kind of stopping and listening to see if I could hear noise. I heard some branches breaking and and here and there and in the background, but again, it was so damn windy. You know, I know some of it was probably him, but, uh, you know, it was hard to hear anything. And I just was happy I wasn't hearing, you know, a a, a thousand pound bowling ball running through the woods next to me. You know, because my, you know, I was like, that's why I had my 44 Magnum out and my rifle slung over my back because I figured he's going to ambush me on this trail. The, the handgun's going to be much better weapon of choice, you know, if that happens. Yeah. So thank God I got out to the main trail where the meadow was at and I ran down um, the hill the rest of the way. I had, you know, I, I had a, a, a little bit of a breather right there. But in the meantime, we all have walkie talkies. Everybody had to have a radio and you, you weren't allowed to hunt. You had to have a radio. So. You know, I'm ripping, I ripped all those shots off. And the next thing you know, everybody and his brother is keying my, is keying my radio, you know? Right. So, so my, my uncle's like, Mike, are you okay? What's going on? Hey, did you get, you know, everyone's like, Hey, did you get the deer? You know, did you get him? Did you get him? We heard the shots. We heard the sh-. And I'm like, no, no, I miss, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and I, and I just said, Uncle Ray, I'll, you know, I'll talk to you when I get back when you come back down to the cabin, right? And I shut it off because I figured I don't want him honing in on me if he's going to hear that, you know? Yeah. So I got back to, like I said, the meadow and I ran down back to the cabin. All the old timers were in there, you know, telling their war stories, cook, you know, they did all the cooking and the cleaning and, you know, and, and I, and I, I got back in there and they're like, man, what was all the shooting? Did you get your deer? Blah, blah, blah. Um, Jeff, I was so angry at this point. I, I said, you know, I just looked at these guys and I said, no. <laughs> I said, I didn't get a deer. I said, how long have you, I don't want to use, I keep using profanity and I forgot about you. This is going to be on your, your I apologize for the swearing. Yeah. It just brings out emotion, you know, the emotions in me. But I was like, how long did, have you guys known about this thing? And they're just looking at me like, what are you talking about? I said, don't give me that 
stupid look on your face. You know, how long have you guys known that that freaking thing was living, has been living up on the mountain up there? And I said, I just had a run in with that thing. And I don't think I would have made it out of there alive. Okay. The deer was probably going to take, I ended up chasing away by accident. Yeah. Okay. I shot it one, missed it. This thing is right behind me, roughly about 30 feet. And it's growling at me. It's shaking the tree. I mean, Jeff, the shadow, I could see somewhat of a shadow outline in the, in the, in the tree from this thing, from where he was standing. I can't even imagine how tall this thing was. Like I said, he was his, his knee was above my head. I'm five ten, so when I'm sitting on the ground, you know, I mean, I don't know. I would say he was at least ten feet tall. Right. Yeah. You know, and he and he was probably over a bit of a thousand pounds. I mean, like I said, that leg of his looked like it was as, yeah. as big as the tree trunk. I don't mean to cut you off, but we are yeah. definitely coming up on recording okay. time. Did they say anything to you after that? Did they? No, they, 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 they just, they all laughed and smiled and stared at each other. Okay. I knew, they, 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 and I said, and don't act, you know, and I said, and don't act, you guys act like you guys don't know what I'm talking about. I said, you know, I, I thought, I thought I was going to lose my life up there today. Right. And then finally one of them said, listen, it's never hurt anybody. It's never killed anybody. You know, just don't shoot at it again <laughs> or try and kill it. You know, it's been here since the cabin, since the association started. So one of them finally cracked and told me, but don't say a word. I'll deny everything I just said to you. Keep your mouth shut. Yeah. So I have not been hunting since then. Jeff. That should be a rule. You know, that should be one of their rules to just, if you're going to be a member of that, they tell you up front, but it's got to be kept, you know, what, what stays it. You know, I, I always, at hunting camp, it was what happens at hunting camp stays at hunting camp, you know? Yeah. So. Well, and, and they said he came down off the mountain. They said, oh, he lives in one of the cat cavern caves up on in state game land. He comes down off the mountain looking for food. You know, he never hurt anybody. He goes, just don't shoot at it again, you know? Right. You know, well, thanks for telling me after, yeah. as an afterthought, you know? Yeah. Listen, um, I just want to make sure that I, I don't mean to cut you. But sure. we do got to end because um, I only got about an hour and a half recording time and we're about three minutes short. Um, do you okay. want to say anything before we end the upload? Um, just I, I want to tell thank you, Jeff, for being brave and courageous and having a platform for people like us to get this stuff off our chest because it, it helps a lot to talk about it. And if anybody out there has an experience – Please, please do yourself a favor. Don't hold it in. I know personally what it's like to suffer from PTSD from these things because I was trying to convince myself I, I didn't believe what I actually saw. And and uh, just meet it head on, read about it, learn about it, and you'll be able to deal with it much better. It, it's helped me immensely by talking about it. Right on. Do me a favor. Don't hang up. I want to talk to you for a few minutes after. Sure. All right. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. I'd like to thank you all for supporting the channel. Your support is what makes this channel continue to grow and go and also what makes it special for people like Quinn and others who want to feel comfortable sharing their experience with no judgment or ridicule. And that's all because of you guys. Thank you. Everyone, please stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant, keeping an eye on our kids, our pets, our family, and friends. And why I say that? Because our kids are our future and the most precious gift we are given. Our pets, because, well, they are the best security alarm we can have. Family and friends, well, because they are the people we love and care about. And that's who we need to share this information with to keep them safe. Please, everyone. Do this and it may help save their lives someday. Everyone, thank you once again. And with that, never stop asking questions, never stop searching for answers, and God bless.